Today down in the comments, it's cold out. We just had a big snowstorm here. I want to know what is your favorite winter themed horror movie? Winter or snow? I guess the thing can kind of count there because it's snowy. Uh, let's hear it down in the comments. Hello, I'm Adam Caesar. This is Project Black T-Shirt, the channel where we take a new or a reissue horror movie or horror movies and then pair it with a reading recommendation that you will enjoy if you like those movies. If you like this video, please hit like. If you really like this video, please subscribe. If you subscribe to the channel, thank you so much for hanging in there. We went uh, a little dark for three-ish months there since Halloween. Uh, nothing huge on my end, nothing like uh, earth-shatteringly personal other than the fact that I was very, very, very busy. As some of you know, uh, I am also a writer. Uh, in that three months, the paperback edition from Harper Teen of Clown in the Cornfield came out. This won the Bram Stoker Award. Uh, last year, last time they had the Bram Stoker Award for uh, Best uh, Young Adult Novel, there's been a sequel announced, Clown of the Cornfield 2, Friendo Lives, which you can pre-order. I'll put the links down below. And then uh, the crazy thing about uh, writing and being someone that um, tries to make his living off of writing is uh, projects come and projects uh, get kind of greenlit and you're told to go and you're told by your editors and your agent to go write. And sometimes that happens in kind of quick succession. So I've, since speaking with you last, uh, I've handed in two uh, full-length novels. I've handed in four issues of a comic book that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, and then uh, an entire feature film, well, which uh, me and my screenwriting partner wrote, uh, which hopefully we're gonna get to talk to you about uh, at some point. Some of these things are gonna be announced. That's a crazy thing. Cause I can just say like, I can say two books uh, four comics and uh, a movie, an entire movie, and uh, I'm not allowed to tell you about what what they are or any of that. And that's kind of the way publishing and stuff works, just slow. Uh, so I'm done with all that, and I'm back to, well, I've been watching movies the whole time, but I'm back to watching movies, and I'm back to talking about them, uh, and I've missed you all, uh, so I hope you've missed me. So get ready. We're going to talk about three movies today, uh, not really linked in any way, shape, or form, other than the fact uh, that they were released through from uh, Severin Films. And then I've got a really good book recommendation for you, a book that's uh, coming out just as I'm uh, just as I'm recording this video. It's going to be out within the next week or so, but it's really, really good. Uh, so I hope you'll you'll hope you'll enjoy. And let's let's talk about movies. First movie I want to talk about is Night of the Demon. I don't remember. I, I guess this is this uh, release from this year. This was released as part of um, Severin Films' this Black Friday sale. They did this nice uh, slipcase edition of a movie I've kind of heard about for years and years and years. I'm familiar with some of the crazier scenes because they kind of come up a lot when people talk about really messed up, really uh, crazy uh, grindhouse or B-movies uh, or video nasties in this case because this was one of the films um, censored in the UK as a video nasty. But it's one of those things where you can hear a lot about a movie, you can hear a movie's kind of reputation preceding itself, but some movies are kind of impossible to spoil the fun of because when I finally got to sit down with Night of the Demon after after hearing about it for years and years, um, I was still kind of blown away by how odd it is and how crazy it is and how gory it is um, and how charming it is in a weird way. This cover here, which is kind of a misdirection, it looks like your typical early 80s slasher movie. This movie was made and finished in 1979 but wasn't released uh, until 83 or the, the, the dates are all weird on this movie because it didn't get much distribution. It looks like, oh, we've got hands and we've got an ax. This must be your typical uh, slasher movie. It is not. This is a Bigfoot movie. Uh, the very first sequence in this movie is uh, a camper getting killed and uh, uh, your kind of traditional kind of Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot track, then watching that track fill in with blood. Uh, and then the title comes up, Night of the Demon. This is a... Uh, a Bigfoot movie unlike any other Bigfoot movie I've ever seen, and I know we've kind of talked about Bigfoot movies on the channel before, I don't re quite remember what video, but I know I've talked about uh, Willow Creek and Exists and The Legend of Boggy Creek and all these movies. I really, really like the, the Bigfoot subgenre, the cryptid subgenre, but there's, there's something extra in this movie. You've got uh, a real regional feel to it, a real outsider feel to it, because none of this kind of cuts together. This was uh, directed by a guy, and I think fully or co-written by a guy named James C. Wasson, uh, and he set out to make kind of a uh, a more understated, a more bloodless, a more uh, the search for Bigfoot kind of thriller movie. Then the producer, uh, James Ball, 
who has a really interesting career. There's a long uh, interview with him on here about all these different points in Hollywood and not Hollywood and, and erotic cinema that he had kind of made his mark. Uh, but when it came time to make this, he went in and shot a whole bunch of extra footage that's all the kill scenes. There's there's a scene where uh, Girl Scouts are out and they're attacked by Bigfoot and they both have knives because they're doing like Girl Scout stuff and then they end up stabbing each other. Uh, there's a guy there's a guy who pulls over to the side of the road to take a leak and Bigfoot rips off his ding dong. Uh, there's this is a wild weird gore movie that has these long stretches of traditional Bigfooty naturey. Taking Bigfoot halfway serious, you see newspaper clippings, all these articles, and and they talk about it kind of like uh, those pseudo-documentary Bigfoot movies. Stuff like uh, In Search of Bigfoot and uh, Cry Wilderness. Movies like that that are almost kind of nature documentaries. That has a little bit of, of this thrown in with the abject gore. And then the final sequence, and this isn't much of a spoiler to say, but the final sequence is uh, is a, a siege on a cabin where our characters were all holed up and the Bigfoot is just this like they got like some muscle man guy in, in, a, in, a, in a mask and they, they, they put they sewed wigs together to put his fur on him it's very very odd looking Bigfoot and very uh, just if, you, if this sounds like the kind of thing very cheap very uh, rudimentary very odd very um, made in someone's kind of house type, I think, which I think the final cabin is just the producer's garage. Um, if that sounds like it appeals to you, go buy this edition. It's great. It's actually two discs. There is all that stuff with uh, James Wasson and, uh, and Jim Ball. There's all that kind of behind the scenes stuff about the film itself. And then the second disc is a, is a feature length documentary about Bigfoot movies. Uh, so it covers all different kinds of things. Or, or there's all this extra material that's just about cryptid movies in general. Uh, so this is this is well, well, well worth it. Severin kind of began the year with a bang releasing this. And then they, as we'll see, uh, talking about these other releases, they kind of kept it up. And they must have a new printer. I don't usually talk about this kind of OCD stuff, um, but they must have a new printer for the, uh, for the slip covers because they're just a lot nicer. They're just matte. They're thicker than the old ones. The old ones... The old ones when you got like a, oh, it's a limited slip cover from Severin. They used to be like the movies would get jammed in them. They'd almost tear when you're trying to take them out. These aren't like that. So I know it, it, it's a silly thing to focus on, um, but some collectors uh, like myself do uh, focus on them and do it. It does add value. So these are nicer. Next movie we want to talk about uh, is also from around 1979, but was actually released in 79, 80 when it was supposed to be released. This is Don't Go in the House. Another movie, I guess there is a kind of a linkage to at least between two of these movies. Another movie that showed up on the uh, British Video Nasties list. Uh, Severin had this, this nice limited edition slipcover that's kind of the uh, a takeoff on the old VHS clamshell. And you open it up and you get the more traditional art in there. If you've if you've done much reading about regional movies or B-movies or exploitation movies, you've probably seen the kind of main image from Don't Go in the House, which is our main character uh, kind of dressed up in his uh, World War II firefighters, this kind of incinerator outfit. He's got the little uh, blast shield here. It's very, and he's holding a flamethrower. It's a very emblematic image of this time in uh, horror movie making. Uh, but if you haven't seen the film before, you're probably like, oh, this is about a guy. It's kind of like a psycho thing because at the very beginning of the movie, his his sick mother finally gives up the goat and dies. Uh, we know she was abusive to him. And that's the last straw and he has a breakdown. And he's, he builds a room in his house where he can burn women alive. Which just from that synopsis, just from that description, which is true, that's what the movie's about. Uh, you might get the impression that this is a much more mean-spirited movie. This is a much more... Um, uh, kind of exploitative and uh, gross movie than it actually ends up being. It's pretty restrained. There's there's basically just one scene of him uh, doing his thing, and then the rest of it's all implied. It's much more of a character study than you'd really expect most uh, this movie to be from its reputation, from being on the video nasties list. That's not a bad thing. If you compare this to something like uh, Night of the Demon. This is a movie that's 10 times better made. It was shot in and around um, 
the Highland area of New Jersey, also in New Rochelle. So these, these were filmmakers coming out from Manhattan, um, putting, putting actors and actresses on buses, they talk about that in the special features, and just sending them up to the end of the line at Port Authority, Port Authority so they can film in New Rochelle and film in Jersey. Um, but it's got a really kind of nice uh, local feel to it because they shoot all around. We're somewhat sympathetic to Norman and Psycho, but we're even more sympath sympathetic to Dan Grimaldi from The Sopranos uh, character here. A loner, he's kind of a, a socially awkward, something's up with him, uh, and the movie really is through his eyes and really does try, try to kind of get you sympathetic towards this guy that's doing terrible things because of his history of abuse and stuff like that. I don't know that we 100% are like rooting for him, but it's it, it's more of an interesting character study in that way, in that it's like almost like Willard instead of instead of rats, instead of loving his rats, as he just loved his flamethrower. You kind of get the idea of don't go in the house. There's this whole subplot with a Catholic priest and his coworker who's trying to kind of reach out to him and help him. Would make an interesting double feature with Alice, sweet Alice, uh, just because of those kind of Catholic overtones and because they're shot pretty near each other. Uh, in Jersey. This is directed by a guy named Joseph Ellison. A uh, really, really uh, good movie. The house itself, the titular Don't Go in the House, is really creepy. It's this dilapidated mansion that in the special features, there's this cool special feature with Michael Gingold, where he goes to all the different locations, and you see like almost none of the locations. They go to a disco in here, and the disco is now like a school uniforms uh, center. You go to the fl florist and the all these different places that he goes in the movie to kind of try to find women. And they're all like CVS pharmacies and stuff like that. But the house, the house is actually uh, fixed up and looks better than it ever did. And there's kind of like a little museum in it now uh, because it was a, a, a landmark of local significance, not because they shot Don't Go in the House there. This is another one where there's two discs, but unlike the Night of the Demon disc where they kind of separated, this is mostly all about the movie. Um, the first disc is is kind of producers and an uh, archival interview with Dan Grimaldi, and then the second disc uh, is is Joseph Ellison's kind of the star there. Yeah, that's Don't Go in the House. The last movie I want to talk about is actually uh, a part of this box set. You might have seen this around. This is All the Haunts Be Ours. This is a, a really huge, really kind of um, ambitious uh, box set that Severin put out. It is... 20 feature films plus 15 hours of special features and it just has like a bunch of short films on each disc. Uh, but what we're really going to talk about is we're just going to talk about uh, Eyes of Fire. I'm kind of watching them in order and then there's the whole set's built around uh, this Kayla Janice uh, documentary, like multi three hour documentary. that's all about folk horror. So I'm going to watch all the movies then circle back to the first disc, which is the documentary. Uh, but this, uh, this set's amazing. The production value is uh, awesome. The, uh, it's got a little book here, and then it's got all the films in this set. But what I'm going to be talking about is just Eyes of Fire, which has a standalone release. They release this exact disc with the same special features and the same short films. Uh, they released as a standalone release. 1983, directed by a guy named Avery Crounce. We'll talk about uh, a little him a, a little bit in a second. But this was a, uh, a movie where when the set was announced, everyone quickly was like, oh, Eyes of Fire is part of this. And that was kind of the headline uh, release of the set, and that's why they're releasing it outside of the set as a standalone thing. And usually I'm pretty up with this stuff. Usually I've at least heard of movies when they're getting announced, and I kind of knew nothing about Eyes of Fire. Uh, I guess it's been harder to see and harder to find uh, for a number of years, but uh, folks who've seen it on VHS and, and, and kind of grew up with it in a way uh, were really making a big, uh, a big stink about, oh, Eyes of Fire, Eyes of Fire, Eyes of Fire, as, as part of this set. Uh, and now having, having seen it and having go into it, that's a great thing. Like with stuff like don't go in the house or uh, night of the demon, uh, I, there's a whisper network and you hear about it for years and it kind of builds the movie up eyes of fire, uh, until a month out from this release coming out, I never even heard of it. Uh, so I kind of had no preconceptions and, and no idea even what it was other than the fact that it was headlining a folk horror set. So I kind of imagined it would be folk horror. Uh, Eyes of Fire is about a, uh, a group of settlers uh, in pre-revolutionary America. They're, they're led by this priest. They've, they're like, they're a bunch of adults and a bunch of kids. And the priest is like a polygamous priest. And he's like seduced all the kids' moms. And the story's told out of order. So the, 
at the, at the end of the story, the kids wander into a, a French encampment and they're telling their story and, and what happened to their uh, to the adults that they were with and they're narrating it. Uh, so we know that something bad happens to the adults um, and we know that these kids uh, survive, but we don't quite know what. They find this valley to settle in where they find cabins and stuff like that. It's very, um, it's very like if you've ever gone to Colonial Williamsburg, it, it, the first little bit of this feels like, okay, this feels like uh, reenactors uh, kind of putting on a little, like almost community theater level production of like Salem witch trials kind of thing. But then the movie gets weirder and weirder and weirder and the imagery and themes get uh, a lot more esoteric. And that's where like the meat of the movie is and that's where the good stuff in the movie is. Um, there is... Uh, an evil witch. There is a good witch that lives with them. That this Irish girl that something's up with. She doesn't quite speak English, or she speak when she speaks English, it's all cryptic, and she's protecting the kids, and she might be a fairy. Um, and this all this different stuff. It's all packed into eighty four minutes. Uh, I was talking with my buddies in the group text where this movie, after the kind of hype for this movie coming out of Blu Ray, both of them were like oh, I didn't like it. It bored me. Uh, and I pushed back on that. I did not, I did not agree with them, but know that, know that the opinion is, uh, out of three of three people I've talked to that's seen it, um, two of them didn't like it. So take this recommendation with a grain of salt. Uh, I really liked it. I think it's great. The visuals, uh, for, especially for early eighties, especially for kind of what the movie sets you up as like, okay, it's people in wigs speaking in English accents, um, in the woods maybe this isn't going to be for me. But like, th once those special effects hit, and once those optical effects hit, and once these really uncanny things start to happen, um, the movie punches way above its weight class, at least in my opinion. Uh, there's really, really cool stuff with, uh, with faces growing out of trees, and different spirits, and um, superimposing all these cool optical effects where these thralls of the witch are like appearing out of nowhere and there are these like naked people covered in mud it's really kind of creepy and unsettling uh in a way that films from this era and especially like regional horror films don't tend to be and don't tend to be that effective and i think a large part of that is uh avery Krauss, uh he was a still photographer first and not just like a uh, an okay still photographer he was a uh, very innovative in the, I guess, late 70s and, and, uh, and 80s. And he was uh, published in all these different art magazines and had all these different shows. And he was doing things with like uh, combining images, double exposures, and all this kind of like trick photography stuff I don't quite understand. But he, he uses those techniques in the movie. And it, you can tell like, oh, this is this guy's expertise. This is his, uh, this is what he's really good at. And this is what this movie is kind of gonna showcase. Uh, I really liked it. I think it's great. Your mileage very much may vary, and I'm sure I'm going to have people down in the comments yelling, to, yelling, at, uh, yelling at me about it. But this, the important thing is if this set's expensive and uh, I think even add a printer ready, uh, but if you have Shutter, I think most of the set, if not all of the set, uh, is now the Severin put together a little folk horror collection, and you can watch all of these on Shutter right now. You know, they're the Shutter streaming quality. Not quite the perfect uh, from the Blu-ray uh, new 4K restorations of some of this stuff, but pretty good, uh, especially because Shutter's like five bucks a month, I think. But that's the that's the perils of this of this being in this era where there's these beautiful box sets coming out. Because I got this, I got the Arrow Shaw Brothers. Um, I also I still have the Andy Milligan set that I'm working my way through. Uh, you could kind of buy one of these box sets, and that's that's like two or three months worth of viewing if you're. If you're like me, that, that takes a while. So I've got a backlog of stuff, but I wanted to talk about that a little bit. This week's book recommendation is Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin. Uh, this is a book that if you're in the horror fiction scene, you've probably seen this, uh, this, this cover around. This cover is wild and gross because yes, it's two plums. There's a bite out of the one plum. But if you look at, look at that cover, you know what that's supposed to be. Uh, but this is a book called Manhunt. It is uh, kind of why the last man, uh, I guess, gender apocalypse would be the subgenre it's in. It is about a, a sickness that spreads 
and this kind of rage virus that turns uh, all, all affects all men and turns them into uh, raving, uh, violent, sexually violent monsters. Uh, and the focus in this story is on uh, two trans women as they're making their way uh, across the countryside. It's kind of episodic because they kind of like, they start out one place and they go to another place and they solve a problem and then they kind of move on and it all builds and builds and builds and you get a kind of uh, more zoomed out view of the world and how the world has, has moved on or not moved on through these women's eyes. And it is, uh, if, the, if the cover seems provocative, uh, the content of the book is, uh, this is, a, this is a, the ultimate, okay, probably not for everyone watching this book recommendation, uh, probably not even for like the target demographic of my own books since I write YA fiction. Uh, this is firmly for adults. Um, Tor Nightfire is putting this out, which they're, you know, their Tor is a, is a big company. They're Macmillan branch. Uh, like, I cannot believe that a big that a big publisher is taking a chance on a book this gory and this brutal. The best kind of comp to it would be the splatterpunk books of the 80s would be like Skip Inspector and, and books like that because that's how kind of extreme and extreme and punk it is because this is a book that like knows that it's pushing buttons and knows that it's trying to piss you off in certain ways and it does it in a very effective and um, at least to me, I was kind of giggling most of the way through this book, even though it's it's very heavy. It's, it gets quite sad. It has big issues and big kind of grapples with big social problems. It is a really smart book and a really delicately put together book, but it's also just like gnarly and mean and funny. Uh, so I like books that get to be all those kinds of things. So I really, really liked Manhunt. Uh, I was sent this months and months ago uh, to see if I would give like a, a blurb to put on the inside copy. And a lot of times I'm sent stuff and I just say, no, no, I can't. Like, I, I don't have time, which I was busy. I really don't have time. But this was a book that just from when that cover was released, I was really interested in seeing what the hell it was about. So I made it a, pri uh, a priority and I'm glad I did. Um, but that's the thing when you're sent stuff so early and when, when reviewers get stuff months and months ahead of time, you get really amped about a book and then you want to talk about it right now, right, right then, but it doesn't really do the author any good. It doesn't really do the book any good. Um, if you're talking about, Oh, this thing you can have in six months, I just consumed it and it was good. So I, I've been patiently waiting to talk about this book, uh, until right now it is, I think it's out. It should be out when you're watching this video or it comes out next week. I'll put a link down in the description. If it all sounds like the thing you want, a thing you want to read, um, it's, it, I can't think of a better version of what it is. Uh, so know that, but also know that I, I put up all those warnings. Look up if you're at all, if you're at all uh, squeamish or at all, like don't think you can handle it. Look up uh, content warnings or whatever, uh, because if you think you don't want to tangle with it, you're probably right. It's probably too much for you. But if you, uh, if you like this, this, this kind of thing, uh, you'll really like it like I did. Um, it's great. Manhunt. All right, that's it. We did it. We talked about three movies and a book. It feels good. It feels good to be back. Like I said, I've missed y'all. Um, I've been spending some time on uh, TikTok because it, it's a lot quicker to, to, to edit those videos and post those uh, than, than YouTube. So I'll put links down to that. And then I've got my normal uh, Twitter and websites and stuff like that. Please, uh, please, if you haven't read Clown in the Cornfield, pick up the new uh, paperback because the new paperback includes a 15-page, yes, that's right, 15-page preview of the beginning of Clown in the Cornfield 2, Friendo Lives. Uh, please pre-order that book. Pre-orders help me out so much. There's a, there's a real ending to Clown in the Cornfield 2. I will say that much. But if they were to be like, we'll do three, I I jump on board. So please, please, please. The only way that's going to happen is with pre-orders. And if you tell your friends and if you review these books and, and keep enjoying these books. Uh, so thank you so much. I will see you within the next month. We'll say that. I won't say, say see you next week, but I'll see you within the next month. Uh, it's been great seeing you. Goodbye.